Hello. How are you? <laughs> wow. I I thought I was good, but I'm not sure if I'm that good. What's uh what makes you so excited in this moment? I'm faking it because I'm annoyed with life. Um, <laughs> um, to be why so totally annoyed? honest, I when I was in seminary, I had this little old lady as a professor for one of my classes, the exegesis of Acts, and she would come in with her Greek New Testament and this little Greek verb parsing book that she always used, and. She never used English translations, hadn't in years, and she would look at certain verbs, and when she couldn't understand it, she would just mutter something like, you know, there are just some Greek verbs that bring me close to losing my sanctification. (laughs) And that's how I feel this morning. Uh, I have had COVID since uh, last week, and... Yesterday, I desperately wanted to test negative, and I didn't. I still tested positive. This morning, I was desperately wanting to test negative, and I didn't. I still tested positive. I am ready to tear my hair out. I am just going bananas. Oh, I'm sorry. COVID is not a Greek verb, but uh, it is still very maddening. COVID, COVITAS. Um, <laughs> That by the that be well, noun, but you know that whatever. would be a noun. Oh, well done! Yeah, I, I even know that that would make it. I think a third declension noun. If I'm oh my gosh, look at you! Yeah, I know. For somebody who doesn't know nearly enough about Greek to actually have it be helpful, I know a lot of useless Greek. <laughs> so I can look impressive without actually making a difference in anyone's life. It's wonderful. That's uh, that's fantastic. I did not come close to losing my salvation, though I did have a Greek verb that really stumped me this morning when translating, and I was kind of frustrated. I couldn't find any. I looked it up in all my textbooks to see if I could find the morphological reason why this verb was the way it was, and nobody told me, and I'm kind of irritated. So just in case you ever resume your Greek, the aorist participle for echo is sco. Why? I have no idea. None. Nobody told me. Hmm. We sure know how to loop our audience in. I know. Everybody's Uh, riveted right now. But uh, so what are you calling about this morning? Well, we're we're kind of rigid in some things on this show. And that is like, we do our intro, you know, hey, how are you kind of thing. Then we go into the main topic. Then we like talk to the audience a bit and then we do like thoughts from each of us. And then we end with a witch josh. Like that's just our rhythm, Mm -hmm. but I want to break our rhythm. Can I do that? Mm. (laughs) Does that irritate you like COVID and Greek verbs? I have a mug of tea so I can handle it. It's soothing jasmine green tea. So it will help me make it through. I'm so glad you chose that. But is there like a tea that would like amp you up? Like nobody ever says, I've got this flaming cup of tea here that's really just got me aggravated. Like, isn't all tea soothing? That's my question. I I think so. I don't know. I only drink one kind of tea. So as much as it sounds like it was right for this conversation, all I drink is jasmine green tea. Um, So I am not just rigid about this podcast. I'm just rigid. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, enjoy anyway, your very rigid jasmine green tea. Yeah. So anyway, yes, please, by all means, tell me your thought that apparently launches you into a longer thought. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. So I'm going to use my thought segment right now, and I want to talk a little bit about what I just read in Richard Bauckham's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Mm. And I think the thought itself is interesting, but what I really want to talk about when I'm finished is what is the relationship of scholarship and the church? Mm. They obviously go hand in hand, but I, I really want to know what you think the relationship is, because I find that what I'm about to share is just brilliant scholarship. So 
I just want to use this as a case example of brilliant scholarship and then talk a little bit more about the relationship between that and the broader church. Mm, Well, fire away. And I'm excited to hear this. This is a bit of a preview for me. I have never read Bauckham, but in our series on Revelation that we're doing later on in the fall, one of the books we're going to read together is by Richard Bauckham. So I'm excited to hear, kind of get this little bit of a preview of his writing and thinking. Right. Um, And yes, so brilliant writer and thinker. So I will get to that, but you just reminded me our Revelation series is not the only series we have coming up. Mm. Um, Our Revelation series will come out in October, but starting on Memorial Day, we will be running our Summer in the Psalms series that's going to run from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And we Mm. would love to encourage our audience to read the Psalms along with us and be thinking some of these same thoughts. And then we're going to bring some of the Psalms to our conversations. They might be the main topic, or they might fall into the thoughts category. But either way, every week for the summer, we will continue to talk about the Psalms, just like we did last year. And we'd love to participate in that with our audience. Yeah, absolutely. I was astounded how rich the Psalms were as we read through them together uh, last year. And it was amazing. We finished it up and I think it took us about five minutes to decide we were definitely doing this again uh, (laughs) this year. And so I love the fact that reading the Psalms this way means we end up reading about, what, 18 verses a day or something like that? 23-ish. 23. I was close. (laughs) But, uh, you know, that's enough that you can read slowly, but it gives you some continuity and I'm just super excited. We're going to have a lot of fun with that. So. We will post a schedule every week for what to read, and you can read right along with us whenever we post the schedule or any other of our posts on social media. Please comment what you're reading and what you're learning and what is surprising you or impressing you or how the Psalms are forming you. Uh, We would love to have you be a part of that journey with us. 100%. We will also post in PDF form the entire reading schedule in the show notes to this episode and every episode throughout the Summers in the Psalms series. So you can always download it there. All right. Absolutely. Well, without any further ado, Richard Bauckham, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Uh, So Bauckham is talking about the anonymity of some of the characters in Mark's gospel and why they might be anonymous in Mark's gospel but later named in John's gospel. Mm. And what Bauckham says, he actually pulls from an article written by another guy named Thiessen. And the theory is that this was some level of protective anonymity because all of the events that surrounded Jesus's crucifixion really riled up all of Jerusalem. And not only was Jesus crucified, and resurrected and all of the different hubbub that came around all of that. But we got to remember that as John identifies it, Peter cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. And so there's a lot of like all the Jesus followers and the established church are really at loggerheads and it's a very dangerous situation. And so when Mark writes his gospel, Bauckham argues that Mark is writing to the Jerusalem church and doesn't want to, A, out somebody as being responsible for certain things that are still under investigation, and B, doesn't want to stir the waters and stir things up where they don't need to be. So in other words, Jesus's messianic entry on the donkey is described, but a lot of the messianic and kingly overtones to it are muted in Mark's gospel. And when it comes to certain characters, as I said, they are anonymous. So who are some of these anonymous characters? Uh, The woman who anoints Jesus is 
anonymous in Mark's gospel. We later learn through John that it's Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And why might that be? Well, John's gospel also tells us that after Lazarus was raised from the dead, everybody wanted to kill him. He was a marked man. And so the Lazarus story only even exists in John, who wrote much, much later. And so we wouldn't really want to like identify any member of his family in this gospel. Then the man who wields the sword and cuts off the high priest's ear or the, the servant of the high priest, well, that's Peter. But we don't learn that until we get to John's gospel. In fact, in Mark's gospel, he doesn't even name the servant of the high priest. John tells us that guy's name is Malchus, but he just kind of genericizes it to hopefully kind of brush past it and not inflame things even further. All of this is Bauckham's argument. And I really appreciated it because it's fascinating to put time and place and circumstances all together. And what would it have been like to live in Jerusalem after the events of Jesus's passion and all of the turmoil that would have been there? I think it just brings life and vitality to the text. And I appreciate, and this is where the scholarship piece comes in, I appreciate the insight and the careful reading that it took to make these conjectures because it takes a very careful reading of Mark. It takes a very careful reading of John and a very careful comparison of the two to even notice that these differences exist in the first place and then to postulate why they might be. It's fascinating. Mm. I think this is a fascinating question because really you're using this as an illustration, right? Yeah. And so I, I think the idea of what Bauckham is proposing is fascinating, but as I'm listening to you describe it, I am finding myself listening with two different pairs of ears. I myself, as someone who is intrigued by scholarship, find all of this deeply enriching. Mm. Putting all the pieces together and discovering in the nuance of the details how it all works together, for me, makes, as you said, a much richer reading experience, even if I know I'm holding this as a possibility. It reminds me that there is real life behind the details or lack thereof. That yeah. even things I might skim over in a casual read are very likely intentional authorial decisions for a reason. Mm. And on the other side of things, I think of the person who might say, so what? How does it help <laughs> me be a better Christian today? And I have some thoughts on that, but I'm curious what yours are before I jump into mine. Yeah. I mean, I feel like for me, this type of scholarship, like I said earlier, makes it so much more rich and textured. The Bible comes alive as real people experiencing real life under some potentially really challenging conditions or really amazing conditions or what have you. But either way, it humanizes the text. And that's what I appreciate. And I think even of so one of the professors that I had at Denver Seminary, Richard Hess, one of the most brilliant men alive, knows a bunch of ancient Semitic languages. He's highly knowledgeable about archaeology and has been on various digs and wrote a text about kind of archaeology. And he's written a bunch of commentaries. Like, I don't know, this guy is super brilliant. I just think when he knows what he knows and he can paint a picture of the ancient Near Eastern world from archaeology and from what we know about the text and all of these different other texts that he can read and paints a picture of what the laws were like, what the kingships were like, what the treaties were like, and how people practiced their religion and how Israel 
strayed from Yahweh and, and practiced some of the Canaanite religions and all of these different things, it just adds texture and layers and understanding. And all of a sudden you go, oh, this isn't just some mysterious ancient people that lived in the desert somewhere. These were human beings that struggled and, and had these different experiences. And I just, I appreciate that richness. And how does that help me? Well, it makes it so that I don't have to live like as a super Christian, or try to invent how do I fit into an Israelite ancient society or something, I can be just a human being engaging in this process of spiritual formation, just like all of these other people were. Mm. Wow. The thing all of that reminds me of when I think about the question, why does this matter for my spiritual life, is that the Bible is not a simple book written by people who think like me. Hmm. It is a very complicated book written by people who are whose worldview and thinking and language, literally their brains are geared in different ways than mine. Hmm. And the option I have in front of me as a person who wants to learn from the Bible. And I suppose this is the starting point. One of my starting points is if you want to use the Bible to underscore and prop up what you already believe, you're right. Scholarship is not helpful to you. But I doubt anybody in that category is listening to us on a podcast. <laughs> For those of us who genuinely want to invite the Bible to challenge us, we want to give the Bible the opportunity to speak on its own terms. And the real options I have are, on the one hand, to read with blinders I don't even know I have, that I can't fix in any way, shape, or form. Or on the other hand, to engage with the work of men and women who have devoted their lives to seeking out the ways in which everything from culture to philosophy to religion to geography to linguistics to who knows what have shaped the form and content of Scripture that I wouldn't even catch. That's the thing I love about the illustration that you're giving. I have never read Mark and thought, oh, I wonder why he didn't name that guy. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. You need to be a particular level of detail in terms of thinking in order to get there. Yeah. And then to be able to put the pieces together you're not just putting the pieces together about this random person's name. You're the same person who's asking questions about, oh, what does the word justification mean? The same right. person who's asking, what does the word peace really mean? It is a particular approach to scripture that is demonstrated in this one illustration, but there are people for whom this is what they've devoted their lives to. And every generation of scholarship gives us this unique opportunity to see blind spots we didn't even know we had when we were reading the scriptures. Right. I love that you're talking about people who've devoted their lives to these things, because in order to think that deeply about certain things, you really have to devote your whole life to that content area. Like I'm mm -hmm. thinking about two very polar opposite, and I could draw a thousand different examples of the same thing, but just to use two— Going back to Dr. Hess and his knowledge of the ancient Near East and its culture and its archaeology and its climate and its all of these different things and its religious practices, he has invested himself in these ancient Semitic languages and this ancient Semitic way of life. And he has just he's in the deep end. So there's him in one corner. And there's some other corner somewhere where somebody is talking about all of the different Greek manuscripts of the New Testament that we have and comparing these documents and saying, oh, this one 
leaves out that word. This one adds that word. Okay, and here's five other examples where they add the word, and here's 10 other examples of where they didn't add that word. And how does all this go together? Oh, it looks like we can trace it down to one scribal error that was made when this document was created, and then all these other documents like used that document as their source document, and that's where that word dropped off. It looks like we actually should include that word. That was original to the first copy. Okay, we'll add that word. Okay, next variant. And on down the line they go, and they study all of these different variations. And then from that process, we get the compiled Greek New Testament from which all of our translators then start translating it into native languages such as English, French, German, whatever. You need highly specific, detailed analyses going on in both of those worlds, and then we could just continue to add this out forever and ever. Those people have devoted their lives to that little teeny tiny aspect of scholarship, and it's I'm so appreciative of them. Absolutely. Well, and this is where I think it's so important to see the church as a whole rather than just my tiny little corner of the church. Yeah. You know, again, I, I come from a very activist, inner city kind of approach to ministry where if I don't rescue somebody today, they might overdose and die tomorrow. Mm. And there is an urgency and an immediacy to the kind of ministry that I've done most of my adult life. And it's so easy for people in that, on that end of the spectrum to say, well, those people in their ivory towers, I've got people overdosing today and, and whatever, whatever, whatever. But the church as a whole, everybody doesn't need to be doing the same thing. This kind of comes back to Paul's uh, metaphor of the body. Mm. It's so easy to be an eye saying, well, since you can't see you're not really part of the body, rather than recognizing that if an eye could see but didn't have a hand to use in tandem with the eye, seeing would be useless because nothing would ever get done, but vice versa as well. Well, yeah, exactly with the vice versa. That's exactly what I was about to say, right? Because I think it's easy in the scholarship world to look at an uneducated Christian who doesn't really know their Bible very well, but is just endowed with the Holy Spirit and knows how to love and serve people with their whole heart and looks an awful lot like Jesus. That's amazing. And and so I think it's easy to like find that, oh, scholarship and knowledge is the right way to go. And so you have to live there and if you don't know this stuff, then you're not really practicing your faith right. Meanwhile, I don't know, that guy over there looks an awful lot like Jesus and seems to be serving the kingdom quite well and has no idea what a Greek verb is. I think that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And what I think we forget as people in the pews, and despite my reference to Greek nouns, earlier on in the episode, I would very much think of myself as academically a person in the pew. I'm, I am well-read, and there are lots of people who are less theologically well-read than I, but there are lots of people who are vastly more well-educated and well-read than I. And I guess it just depends on who I'm in conversation with, but I'll at least say this. When I am around the more academic folks, it is easy for me personally to feel a level of insecurity. Mm. I ought to be more academic. I ought to be thinking smarter. I ought to be reading harder books. I should be somehow, I'm a better Christian if I'm being more intellectual. And, and by no means do I want to suggest that somebody has said this to me. I'm not trying to say I've been told this, taught this, anything like that. I'm just saying it's really easy for me to fall into that trap. Therefore, the easy way out can be a defensiveness. Mm. I don't 
I don't need it. They don't, they shouldn't be doing that. You know, when I'm really just covering up for the fact that I wish I had put the work in. Does that, does that make any kind of sense? It does because I feel similarly, but in different contexts. When you talk about that individual right there could overdose tomorrow if I don't and die, and so I need to reach them today. That sticks out to me in so many ways. One of which is I work at 911, and the city that I work for has an opioid epidemic going on, particularly with fentanyl. And every single day, Every single day, our staff is doing CPR with somebody, or they're giving the Narcan instructions to somebody. And people are dying from overdoses every single day. And I I have a front row seat to it. Yet, my job is to sit in that front row seat. And I, I'm not out there in the community reaching those people who very well may die tomorrow from an opioid epidemic. So you say you feel a little bit of ought to when you're in the presence of a scholar. I feel a little bit of ought to when I'm in the presence of an urban ministry professional who is on the front lines trying to reach the least, the last, and the lost. So I think it's encouraging in one way to think about, okay, we're a a large body and we all need to be about the things that we were created to do. So I like that in one way, but then also in another way, that doesn't get me off the hook from reaching the least, the last, and the lost. It doesn't get the next guy in line off the hook from reading their Bible for depth of understanding. I don't know. I'm trying now I'm struggling with like guilt versus genuine obligation. Let me propose a possible middle ground that came to mind as you were talking. You know, on the one hand, we've got the, I can hole up and just focus on doing Christianity my way. On the other hand, we've got, I ought to be more like you and do Christianity your way. I wonder if the potential middle ground is that we are simply open to life-changing relationships with people who do Christianity different than we do. So as an urban ministry person, I want to have relationships with people in the scholarly world. And I am confident that by rubbing shoulders with them, they will inspire me and form me. And that's great. And instead of reacting against them. I want to welcome them into my life and allow whatever happens to happen and hopefully vice versa. Yeah, it's fascinating. I almost envision, you know, people groups getting together and on the one hand, hey, let's learn Greek together or let's take a class on ancient Near Eastern culture together so we can understand our Old Testament better. Great, wonderful. And then on the other hand, Hey, let's go serve at the soup kitchen. Hey, let's go on this mission trip. Let's go on a prayer retreat and learn how to pray better. Whatever it is, I see different groups of people coming together to practice outside of their normal bounds. Well, and I think what makes this the most powerful to me is when it's in the context of real relationships. Yeah. Like you were describing just a few weeks ago, with the short-term mission trip that your kids went on, what made it powerful is the ongoing relationship your church has with that particular orphanage. Right. Instead of jumping to the, let me do this activity, let me find a person. Let me connect with a person who's more like who I want to be. And then if that leads to, yeah, man, let's learn Greek together. You know, like you were just Before we were recording, you were mentioning that you may do a Greek class at some point, and it's kind of just a natural outgrowth of you connecting with people at your church. Mm -hmm. I think that's so cool. Things that are natural outgrowth of relationship amongst people who are different from one another is just wild to me. Hmm. 
This is so cool. I feel like this is so reminiscent of our conversation about the three types of churches and the, yeah, do we want to hit the center? Sure. But really, do we just need to be in relationship with people that are different from us to pull us toward the center? That's more like it. And I appreciate that balance yet again. Yeah, I feel the same way. I constantly want to rub shoulders with people who are more academically engaged with the Bible than I am. Uh, I mean, I don't think I prep a sermon without shooting you a text asking you, hey, any sense of whether this particular word or that particular word has any richer meaning than I'm catching just by reading it in a couple of different translations? <laughs> yeah. And and. I love being able to text you that. I get, you know, it's like one step beyond an awesome AI. Um, <laughs> but, but the funny thing is, I know you also enjoy getting those texts. I do. I love them so much. And you're actually one of like three or four people that do that. And I love getting those texts because I love diving in with them. And yeah, it's uh, it's a fantastic I think all of this, you know, maybe this is one way to conceive of it. I, As you were talking, I was thinking about my youngest son. He competes in track and field, and he is very talented with both shot put and discus. And it's as we record today, we're right in the middle of track season. And next weekend, we're going up to Seattle for another competition. And this is like a little bit more of a invitation only, only the top of their schools get to go. And so he was looking at the stats for those who are going to compete. And he's like, oh, I'm not going to place in this tournament. This tournament has got some really talented people here, and I'm not going to be on the podium, but I get to compete with some really quality athletes. And it makes him excited He's a freshman. He shouldn't be on the podium. But in a lot mm -hmm. of contexts, he is. And in this context, he will not be. And he's super excited about it because he loves really good competition and he loves learning from those who are further along in his craft than he is. And I'm thinking about that from the perspective of scholarship or the perspective of urban ministry or a thousand other expressions of the faith, people who are better prayers than I am, people who are more diligent about sharing their faith than I am, all of these different things. Like, can I surround myself with those people and grow by being in proximity to them? That is exciting. I should be just as excited as he is about being with good shot putters or discus throwers. Yeah, and I love the ego health that can look at somebody who's better and not think reactively, but be inspired. Right. That's awesome. That is something for us to all aspire to. For sure. Well, I want to turn to the audience and say, what is your relationship between scholarship and your faith? What is your relationship between other aspects of the faith and what you're growing into. Are there people that you admire and want to use as a guide to getting a little further down the road in some area? And how has that relationship worked out for you? And how have you grown into those relationships? I would love to know how you've taken advantage. Yeah, me too. I would love to hear that. I actually, honestly, if this episode could be a little catalyst for that, and you want to share this with somebody who is further along the path in some area, and you want to say, hey, take a listen to this episode, and can we meet? Because I think you're further down the road in this area than I am, and I'd love to grow from that. I think that would be a cool use of this episode. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I just did this a while back. I asked uh, someone in my denomination to work on a project with me that was in his area of responsibility. And I just told him at the end, I was like, look, and part of my motivation here is I just want to sneak in a little mentoring here. You are a couple steps ahead of me. And this is just a good excuse for me to get to rub shoulders with you because that matters. Mm. Uh, and he just kind of laughed it off, but it was very true on my end. 
man, these are the best moments when you can invite somebody into your life who is further ahead of you in some way, shape, or form. And it doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be, it can just be a conversation. And absolutely, if sharing this podcast is a way to catalyze that conversation, it has done its job. Absolutely. All right. Well, I have already shared my thoughts. So I'm done. I'm going to sit back in my easy chair and I'm going to turn over the rest of the episode to you. Ooh. Well, now I feel a lot of pressure. You should. I should. Um, my thought this week uh, really comes from being in this season of creating my own ministry that is associate leadership and having come out of years of letting other people define the mission. One of the things I am most struck by as I reflect is how vulnerable it is when you are the one defining your own purpose. Mm. You know, choosing to take a step out, to take the risk to start my own thing here is not the most financially efficient option I could take. And the weight of that risk that my family is taking with me fully lands on my shoulders. Not because I'm deciding for my family, but because my, dis my family is deciding to take this risk because they love me and my vision. And that is a huge gift. There are a lot of ways in which that puts a real sense of weight on me. I can't push off, if this goes wrong, I can't push off and say, well, my job was to follow. I just was following and it, was, well, it is what it is. If it goes well, it lands on me. If it goes badly, it lands on me. If I don't put enough effort in today, that's on me. If I don't put enough effort in overall, that's on me. If I don't think of the right solution, that's on me. There's just a significant weight. And I, I think not only do we sometimes follow other people to avoid that weight, in all honesty, I, I think we push that weight off on God sometimes. What is God calling me to do? What is the Christian thing? I think sometimes what we're doing is avoiding the weight of responsibility. Because by, it's scary. By, by asking so narrowly questions like, what is the, the right thing to do or the Christian thing to do? Or what is God calling me to do? Because, boy, it's a whole lot easier if God makes the decision and I just do it. Hmm. Well, and I think the way I'm wrestling with this same vulnerability is maybe at least in my life right now, I feel like maybe the answer to what is God calling me to do doesn't have a title associated with it, doesn't have an established path associated with it, doesn't have really clear boundaries. You know, it's one thing if God says, become a dentist. Okay, I'll become a dentist. And then you become a dentist and everybody knows you accomplished the task and you fulfilled your calling. But if God says, be this sort of person and show up in people's lives this way, oh, okay, I guess I'll try. Like That's so vague and it's so ill-defined and you don't ever get to check the box and say, there, I did it. So I think we want a very clear, check-markable calling that says, do this. And if it's not that clear, then it feels very vulnerable. Yep. I think that's exactly how it feels. And I think you're right. The vagueness of it, the sense of living out the Abraham story of go into a land you do not know is scary and very vulnerable feeling. Hmm. So you ready to awkwardly transition into something far less significant? All right. It's a good old on the phone with Josh awkward transition. I there love it. it. Is. Well, this week's uh, Which Josh question is, which Josh 
has been walked by his dog? <laughs> That's such a good question. I know that this type of thing has happened to my brother, but it has not happened to me. So I think that means you're up. Yes, it is me. I, I was actually having a moment where I was trying to picture uh, you have several dogs, right? <laughs> I, I have two undersized dogs that when put together, almost make a, a whole dog. So <laughs> This is exactly the point I was going to make, is the thought of your dogs trying to walk you is just almost funnier than the story I have to tell about my dog walking me. <laughs> You're right. You know, it's just, uh, yeah. But yes, when I was a child, my grandparents lived next door and they had a German shepherd named Duchess. And Duchess was a wildly out of control dog. So much so that multiple times she escaped from the fenced in backyard merely by ramming her head into the fence so hard that she popped like the nailed pickets out of the wood so that she could get out. <laughs> like this is a determined dog. And for some reason, when I was probably nine or 10, my grandparents thought it was okay to let me walk the dog. And, and my grandparents lived down this giant hill uh, in this like way down. And so I'm walking the dog up this hill and barely managing to restrain her. And I tripped at the top of the hill coming out onto the street. And I fell because the dog sensed the slack in the leash and took off. And I ended up getting dragged across the street and down a little ways because I had my hand like so that the leash was on my wrist and I was holding it so yeah. that I wouldn't lose hold of it. And I couldn't let go. Oh and my gosh. So I had plenty of clothes on because it was like fall or winter or something. So I was well padded and it didn't really hurt. But I, I just remember being dragged through this hedge and then down the street. And I, to this day, have no idea how this ended. Uh, <laughs> so I can officially say that I have been walked by a dog. <laughs> well, so here's the thing. I actually think we should have changed the name of this, which Josh question to which Josh has been walked by a duchess. Ooh, yes, we could. I can say that I've been walked by a duchess. Uh, you know, it's funny. My grandmother would always mess our names up. And the three names she would group together for me were my Uncle Tom, myself, and Duchess the dog. And so she would say, Tom, no, we, we just, no, Joshua. And <laughs> to this day, I don't know why. Like, why was the dog in there? Like, all I know <laughs> is it definitely was not a compliment. Uh, right? Yeah. You were misbehaving just as badly as both your uncle and the dog. Exactly. But, <laughs> oh, well. Uh, well, this has been yet another delightful episode of On the Phone with Josh. How about we do it again next week? I can't wait. I'll talk to you then. Okay. Have a good one. Bye. All right. Bye. What's the car plan?